Sunday mornings, I'm in the book of Luke. Uh, but I felt for family day, I would, uh, it'd be good to preach on family. And so I decided that's what I'm going to do today. I do want to hint, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to give you a hint uh, of, tom- of t- tomorrow, this afternoon's message. I want to give you the title to try to intrigue you with t- this afternoon's message. Yes, it's underhanded. I'm trying to get you all to stay. But listen, this is the, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. This is the title. The missing ingredient in an unhealthy family. The title, I titled it that way for this reason. This afternoon, I'm going to give you the secret ingredient that will make any relationship healthy. Any relationship healthy. Is that enticing right there? A little bit, maybe? I don't know. But this morning, uh, we're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Just to give a little context to what's going on, in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, Peter had just instructed some Christians on uh, really... That they needed to follow the example of Jesus. That was really the point of chapter 2. If I could try to summarize it really short. He suffered for us. And he left an example for us to follow. That's what he was talking about in chapter 2. And he was also letting us know we can trust Jesus. And so that was the the point of chapter 2. We're going to begin in chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. And I think you'll see what it's about as soon as I start reading it. And so if you found your place, 1 Peter. If you don't know where that is. If you work your way backwards, it's... Uh, you know, you got Revelation, Jude, and then the Johns, and then the Peters. So it's not very far if you work your way backwards, okay, if that helps you at all. So start at the back of your Bible. You'll, you'll, it's page 1653 in my Bible. Not that that'll help you, but there you go. All right. First Peter chapter 3. If you would please stand in honor of God's Word, if you're able. <clears throat> We're going to read just the first seven verses. Already, if you're reading ahead, you women are already tuning me out. I know it. I know it. I'm I'm imploring you to listen, please. Likewise, and the likewise is referring to chapter 2 where we're supposed to be in submission to Christ. We're supposed to be following the example of Christ. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price." For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even Sarah, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, notice this, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands... Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here today in Family Day, and even to see some answered prayers in the, in the auditorium today. And, and, and Lord, it's so good to be in your house today. I ask that you would help us with this message, Lord. Uh, help us to understand the truth of it. I believe anyone here from child to oldest adult can get something out of this if we open up our mind to what you have for us. So help us with it this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I titled the message this morning, Family Starts With I Do. Family starts with I do. Uh, I say that to say most people don't think you have a family until you got some kids. You're a couple and then you're a family. That's not correct. A family starts at the altar, the marriage altar, I should say, uh, where I do was said. Now you've probably gathered from the passage and even from the title, we're talking about marriage, husbands and wives. The reason is because a, there is no such thing as a strong family that doesn't have at the helm of that family a strong marriage. No such thing. It takes a husband and a wife, a mom and a dad who are on the same page and loving the Lord together to have a strong spiritual family. 
Now, I'm not a mechanic, and I don't pretend to be a mechanic. I know, I know enough about cars usually to get me into trouble, and that's, you know, that in Spanish. I know enough to get me in trouble, and that's about as far as it goes. Uh, but if you don't, even if you don't know a lot about cars, you can understand this, I believe. If one part of the car isn't working, the whole automobile doesn't usually work. For example, if the, and we're going broad, some of you more mechanically inclined people don't get too specific. If the engine isn't working, it doesn't matter if the transmission or the brakes work, it's not going to work, is it? It's, it's not. You can work on that transmission, and, and you can work on the transmission, but it's not going to help the engine run, is it? You can work on, you can change them brakes out, you got some fresh brakes, and it's still not going anywhere. And likewise, if the transmission isn't wor working, it really doesn't matter. You could have the most powerful engine in the world, but if it doesn't have a good transmission linking it to the differential and, and getting to the tires, it doesn't matter, does it? You, you, you can sit there and rev it up and sound real cool. That's about where you're going to leave it, though, revving it up, sounding real cool. And, and also, if both of those are working, if your brakes don't work, your car will move, but it will not stop as intended. <laughs> you can almost argue the brakes are more important. <laughs> You can get on a hill to get going, but there's only one thing that can slow you down, and it's, or two, I guess. It's either the brakes or a wreck, and you don't want the wreck. Now, I know some of you mechan mechanically inclined men are already thinking, well, there's ways to, you know, if this isn't working, you can make this. I know, I know, I know, but, but I think we all understand this. You can take a part, and you can force it to do something it wasn't intended to do. For example, your ignition switch. That's a very small part of a car, isn't it? Almost, I mean, it's tiny. But if your ignition switch doesn't work, you're not going anywhere. Now, you can say, well, I can hotwire it. Now, the old trucks. Uh, like, I, I, I knew how to hotwire a 78 Dodge Ram Charger because I had one. You know what I mean? I could figure, that's, the only, that's the only vehicle in the world I can steal at this point either. So, it's kind of a bit <laughs> depressing. There's not very many of them out there. So, I could force it to start with hotwiring it and kind of bypass that ignition switch. But here's the point. When you start messing with the car and forcing parts to do something it wasn't intended to do or bypassing certain parts, you can, you can bypass your analog brakes, pulling solenoids out and things. You can do all that. But here's the thing. Understand this. It will not run as well as it was manufactured to, to run, and it will not run as long as it was manufactured to run. Can you at least kind of agree with me on that? If you still disagree with me, don't point it out now. Talk to me afterwards. I don't want to look like an idiot. I'm trying to preach here. That is a lot like a family. A family is made up of a lot of different parts. At this point, my immediate family, my wife and three kids, we've got five parts. Got a husband, a wife, and three kids. And if any of those parts aren't fulfilling their roles correctly, then the family, as God had manufactured it, is not going to run as well or work as long as a family that if all the parts just work like they were God, like God intended them to work. Like God manufactured them to work. Okay, you, you with me so far? Some of y'all look really tired. Is it, did, did I miss a, is it a holiday or something I missed? Y'all stay up too late last night? Uh, okay, so stay with me. Today's passage very clearly explains the roles, or you could say the jobs, of the most important parts of a family. The husband and the wife. Now some of you are saying, well I'm not married. So this doesn't apply to me. Well, let me encourage you. If you ever plan on being married, it's good to get these things worked out ahead of time. Yeah. Isn't it? It's nice when you... Hey, let's use the car illustration. I like if, I'm, if I buy a car that's used, which all the cars I buy are used. They're never brand new. It's okay. Because uh, I'm cheap like that. And uh, if you get a Toyota, it's still going to run forever. Um, <laughs> shameless Toyota plug. Anyways, I, if I buy a new car, I like to drive it around town for a while and make sure it's got no bugs, right? Before I try to take it across country. Right? So if so with the marriage. If you're not married and you think, well, maybe one day I will be, let's go ahead and start working out some of those bugs. Let's start finding some of the mechanical issues now so that when you do get married, it goes off seamlessly. Maybe say, well, I was married and I'm not planning on getting married again. Okay. To you, I would say, I believe if we can understand these principles, it would actually help us not just in marriage, but how we interact in church and even how we interact in, in how we influence our society. It would make us just better people in general. But before I can even get into the passage, I've got to say this. We need to leave behind the modern attitude that everything we do today is done better than it ever has been done before. It blows my mind that we think in 2022, in our society, as it is right now, most think we are at the absolute best apex of where our society has ever been. 
And therefore, since we're at the very best of our society, anything that says something contradictory to what our society is saying, hence the Bible, is wrong. Let me inform you. If the Bible says it's a certain way and society says it's a different way, society's wrong, the Bible's right. Okay, so we've got to, already, before we ever start, I need you to get off this thought process of what our society is saying today. Because I'll promise you this, everything I'm about to say goes completely against what our society today is saying. But that's also why many families are failing today. Because they've left the ways of the Bible that once were in our, in our uh, society. Okay, so we're actually going to start with the wives. <sighs> why am I going to start with the wives? Uh, because verse 1 says wives. That's why. It's not because I would be picky and choosy. Honestly, I'd probably start with the men. Uh, but I'm glad because if I take long enough to preach on the wives, I'm just going to have to skip the, the men so we can get to lunch. You know what I mean? And uh, Just kidding. Just kidding. Don't worry. Women, I, I do want to say this. Stick with me. Some of this is going to get uncomfortable. Some of this is going to sound like, oh, it's just all at me. And then don't worry. I'm going to conclude by just nailing the men, okay? So, that, so just stick with me through the hard parts. It's all right. Hey, I'm with it. You say amen. The men need it. The men need it in this room. So we're going to get to them. I promise. Even if we got a back lunch up five minutes, we'll get to them. But you got to stick with me, ladies, through the first part, okay? All right, verse number one, he starts by saying, uh, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Okay, so the first role, I, I, I phrase it that way, the first role or job, manufactured uh, idea that the wife had, that God has given the wife, is first to be in subjection to her husband. Subjection, it's always fun to, to throw in definitions because those don't make anybody go to sleep. Subje subjection means to be under the power or control or government of another. It's actually a military term and it helps refer to rank. Now already, I know I'm already losing some women. Oh, I got to listen to my husband. Do you even know who my husband is? Most likely, yes. I think I've met all of your husbands, so probably... Uh, <laughs> Well, you, oh, uh, I know. Let me start by saying this. I know it's not easy. I, I, I know it cannot be easy because nobody really wants to listen to anybody else. Would not, now, understand what I'm saying? A lot of people like somebody else to be in charge, but nobody really wants anybody to be in charge of us. Like, I, I don't mind somebody else heading up this project, but I want the freedom and liberty to do whatever I want to do. We saw how much we love our freedom in 2020, huh? About uprising in our country. You can imagine the kind of uprisings that are trying to happen in China because of the no freedom. So uh, I, I'm starting by saying, I know this is difficult. I know this is difficult. I know it's hard. I know it's even sometimes uncomfortable. We also need to state this. Uh, it does very clearly say in subjection to their own husband. So ladies, I'm not, I'm not asking you to be in subjection to all men of all kinds. Forget all men of all kind. They're pigs, they're jerks, they're dorks, they're losers. Forget them. But if you married a guy, I'm hoping you don't think he's a pig, jerk, loser, or something like that. <laughs> so be in subjection to him. And, and my wife is in subject to no even now my wife is very respectful. She'll listen to my father-in-law and my dad and our grandfathers. She, she does that, but she's really only in subjection to me. And so if you try to tell my wife to do something, she has my permission to tell you to kick rocks. <laughs> Say, whoa, we're Come talk to me about it if you, want, if you want to talk about it. That's fine. Because the Bible says, in subjection to your own husbands. Now, yeah. understand, just because this is hard and difficult, we can't just abandon it. We can't just abandon the principle. Well, this is really hard, so forget it. I'm not going to try. And sometimes I think we get this idea. As long as it's easy to do, I'll do it. But as, if, it's, if it's difficult or if it's uncomfortable in any way, then I'm just not going to do it. Well, we've got to get rid of that thought process because the Bible says to do it. There is also no clause that states, as long as your husband is a loving, kind, sweet follower of Jesus, all that, then you subject him. It doesn't say that, does it? There's no clause in there. There's no parentheses. As long as he's a good guy, it just says you're to be subject to him, even if he's a jerk. By the way, why'd you marry him if he's a jerk? Here's some premarital help for you. Who he is now is who he will be when you get married. Now, he's going to change, he's going to adapt, he's going to grow, just like you are, ladies. But the general idea of him is who he will be. We were talking about men playing video games yesterday. It's one of my pet peeves. If he played video games before he got married, don't think that magically by putting a ring on his finger, he's going to throw the video games away. Oh, well, I used to love video games, but now I just adore you all day long. That's not how it's going to work. 
If he, if he was not romantic pre-marriage, guess what? You're not going to get marriage in marriage. Romance. You say, well, I thought maybe once we got married, then why? He's the man you want? If he's the guy you want to marry, he's probably not going to change all that much. Okay, back to what I was saying. <laughs> Sorry, that, I think that was some needed pre-marital counseling for all. As I was saying, it doesn't say there's no clause as long as he's a good man. You say, well, if, I, if he's a jerk and I just submit to him, he's going to take advantage of me with that. Well, in that case, I'd reference you back to chapter 2 where you, to understand you can trust the Lord. You can trust the Lord. But look, look what it says. It, in fact, it kind of states the opposite, that if your conversation is correct, if, if the, and conversation is not just the way you talk, as the idea of your manner of living. If your manner of living is correct, look what verse 1 says. That if, that if any obey not the word, that's talking about the husbands. If he doesn't obey the God, if he doesn't obey the word, they also, without the word, without the Bible, without church, Word, be won by the conversation of their wives. God promises there's going to be an effect on his life if you are doing what you're supposed to do. You know what speaks volumes to your husband? You living for him and living for the Lord. And even when he's a jerk to you, you continue living for him and living for the Lord. It speaks volumes to your husband. He may not say it out loud. He may not say it to you. He may not even say it to God. But in his mind, he knows, man, that's something different. That's something different. So, well, I mean, I, I don't know. It's just our society, I know what our society, our, our society says that women, we, you're, you're supposed to be powerful and you can do anything a man can do and you're supposed to be just like a man. And I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible says. That's right. I'm not, I am not, I'm not saying it, that women are less than. In fact, we're going to get into that. You're, you're actually more valuable than men. You'll see that in a little bit. Yeah, I'm not saying you're less than or you're not as important or you have an a, a, a inferior job. I'm saying that God has, has kind of orchestrated this family car to run in a certain way. And as long as you stay in your spot and your husband does his spot, guess what? The car's going to run pretty smooth. But as soon as you start, as soon as the transmission decides, I'm going to try to be the engine today, the car's not going anywhere. As soon as the engine decides, I want to be the transmission, the car's still not going anywhere. So it's not, it's not about... Uh, Power, it's really just about where God has placed us in a God-given hierarchy of our families. Well, I don't want to. Understand this. If your husband's not saved and you don't want to subject to him, understand this. It's not about winning the battles. It's about winning the war. The ultimate goal should be him loving the Lord too and trying to get him to that point. Because you can be mean and you can win all the battles. And in the end, him still die and go to hell. And it's, you didn't help him one bit on that. So it's, it's about winning the war, not the battle. Second, second role here. He goes on to say, Be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Your second role in the home is to have the right spirit or manner of living to reflect the Lord. That's your, your first job is just being subjected to Him. Your second job is to reflect the Lord in the way you live. How do you conduct yourself in the home? What is your conversation like, women? And, and I know the men, men have the ability... Uh, I know I can come home from work and I can be frustrated and I can be tired and I can throw a wet blanket on the entire house. You know, just kind of ruin the whole attitude and spirit of the house. I know I have that ability. But ladies, let me, let me impress this upon your heart. I don't know why this is. Maybe it's because you're home. If you are home, uh, I don't understand it completely. But women set the tone for the home. Women set the tone for the home. You set the attitude and atmosphere of your home. So what's your home like? If your home is a miserable place, miserable place to be, I, I, I'm going to give some blame to your husband, but I'd also say, well, what's your attitude like? Your attitude and your conversation, your manner of living is what's going to dictate the way your home is. Your role is to have a chaste conversation in the home. That means the things you talk about, the things you promote, the attitude you have, the spirit you carry is supposed to reflect Christ in you. And sadly, if you don't, oftentimes your kids are missing out on that. One of the greatest things I think about the Lord is that He gives us two parents so that even if one parent is good and one parent is bad, you are going, your kids can still be influenced for good. Even with just one. I think that's great. So women, if that's you in your home, you've got to influence, you've got to use it. Number three. I know, I'm trying to hurry. Number three. Your role in the home is to set the example of modesty. 
Your third role in the home is to set the example of modesty. He goes on to say, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on apparel. Now I want to stop and say, some preachers, and uh, I get mad at those kind of preachers, they try to say that this is women shouldn't braid their hair and wear jewelry. And I, and I say to them, if that's what that means, then what is the end of verse 3 where it says of putting on apparel mean? Some of y'all haven't got it. I'll wait. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so before you go making some blanket statement like that, stop. I'm all for jewelry, I'm all for hair fashions and how they change, and I'm all for that, but here's the point. Of, of the Bible, I should say. Here's the point of what, the Bible, what was happening in the Bible. Uh, there were rich women, and here's what rich women, rich women would do, especially in Corinth, is they'd do up their hair and then they'd hang trinkets, jewelry and trinkets, into their hair as a sign to show... I got more money than you. Now we do the same thing today. It's your car, your you know, your 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 jewelry sometimes to communicate, yeah, I've got it and you don't. Uh, but that was what they were doing. They they were wearing certain jewelry just to show I'm better than you. There's also been some that, that suspect that this is also there's ways of doing their hair that was a sign of being a harlot. There were certain hairstyles that only the I'll say the ladies of the night would wear. And so they would have this that certain and he was saying, avoid that too. So avoid, he's saying avoid following the fads of the day is really what he's trying to say. Your, your dress standard should not be determined by the standards the world is setting. Amen. That's what he's saying. Now, I am not, I am not, I am not. Don't, don't leave here saying, well, Brother Stephen thinks we should all dress Amish or like the ladies on the, like the ladies on the little house of the prairie. No, I'm not saying that at all. I like that my wife can dress fashionable and still be modest. I'm all for that. What I'm saying is the, the society outside of us should not dictate the way we currently dress. Amen. Why? Well, mainly because they're wrong. It's immodest. That's the main part. Um, you know, I think the, the big thing today is the athleisure. That's the term. It's like clothes you could work out in, but you know you're not going to go work out. You're just going to wear it all the time. That's like the, that's a fad. And just so I can, you know, maybe I can help this with an example um, so that nobody, we, we'll stop talking about dress for a minute because women get uncomfortable when I talk about dress. Some of y'all remember, I've seen, I don't know, it was back 40, 50 years ago. Somebody had the bright idea that bright orange or like a puke green carpet is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I've been in churches that still have some bright orange carpet or carpet. I remember my grandparents' den still having green sh puke green shag carpet that was all laid over. And, and, and when that stuff was installed, when it was done in the 70s or 80s or whatever, it was probably like, whoa, look at that. Man, that's so pretty. That's so nice. If you put shag puke green carpet in your house today, you're going to get laughed at. Why? Because fads change. And what I'm encouraging you ladies is let pleasing God and pleasing your husband be the thing that determines how you dress. That's, that should be, it shouldn't be for what your neighbors think or your coworkers so you can catch a look or any of that. It should be purely, I want my husband to be pleased by the way I dress and I want my um, God to be pleased by how I dress. You say, well, I'm not married yet. I'm a teenager or, or, or whatever. Well, in that case, you should please in a way, or dress in a way that your dad's okay with. And by the way, even that verse does, does inform us that there's certain ways you can dress at home that is pleasing to God and your husband that you just can't wear outside the home. Because yeah. there's certain things in the privacy of your home that is okay to wear. And there's certain things that you probably, it's not pleasing to God and it's probably not pleasing to your husband if you wear them outside the home. Okay, I'm going to get off dress because I know that makes y'all uncomfortable. Uh, it's biblical, I'm just trying to help us. Okay, here we go. Number four, number four. Understand your role as a woman is a hidden role. Let me read the verse. He says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. You know, some of the most important parts of cars you'll never see, if, you don't, if you're not a mechanic, I mean. Some of the most important parts of cars you will never see, if, if you don't work on your car at all. I understand. I mean, like most of us could point out where the engine is on our car. But man, there's things inside that engine that each one, each little piece is so vital, yet it's never seen. It's never seen. Women, a lot of what you do around the house, nobody really knows about. I've said it before. I don't know what my wife does while I'm at work all day. Some days, I know she does a lot because I can see it. Some days I walk in and go, what did she do today? And, you know, that's probably bad on my part. And she usually says, they're all still alive. That's all she <laughs> says to me, and I get it. 
And, and, and there's a trend, hang on now, there's a trend today of, of I think it's called mom in influencing, being a mom influencer, mom influencer, or whatever, they always cram those words together, which is basically this. In the guise of helping other mothers, women are trying to use social media to project what they do in their hidden lives to show off, essentially. Because, hey, anybody that's had kids, anybody that's kept a home, anybody that's been a wife knows, that's work. Yes, sir. It's a lot of work. My wife does not get paid enough for what she does for me. Amen. And most of what she does never gets seen. You see some of the, the you, you may see some of the uh, effects of some of the things she does. You know, is he learning her memory verse is an effect of something she does. Uh, you know, behavior of kids is an effect. But most of what is done as, of, as a wife and as a mother is unseen. And here's, here's the part. Here's, here's what I'm trying to encourage you. It's okay. It's okay. God sees it, even though most men don't. Even if your own husband doesn't recognize the, uh, the links and the things that you do in and out of the house, that's okay. Also, he goes on to talk about a meek and quiet spirit. Um, let me encourage you. You shouldn't probably be the most domineering voice in the room or in your family. Well, I'm not trying to say you can't voice your opinions, you can't talk. If you know my wife, she talks a lot, more than I do. I know you think I talk a lot because I preach, but she talks way more than I do. Her and my daughter, uh, they just round and round and round and round it goes. It's okay. What, but what she can't be is the loud, domineering, overpowering voice in the house. She's not supposed to. You say, well, that's, maybe that's what the Bible says. Again, forget what society is saying. If the Bible says it's right. God actually says it's an ornament of great price. To God, a meek and quiet woman who is okay with the hidden life, who is okay with doing the things, the grunt work behind the scenes, without the recognition, in, in God's eyes, it's something of great price. Great price. Last thing here isn't necessarily a role, um, but I'm going to give some application to it. It's a wonderful point Peter points out. Look at verse 5 and 6. For after this manner, in the old times, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husband. You know what he's saying in verse number 5 right there? It's worked in the past. It's worked in the past. That's what he's saying in verse number 5. It has worked. You know what we don't know is going to work? All these newfangled ideas about family. We've not seen the track record of it. We don't have any long-term studies. Family done God's way has been going on for like 6,000 years and it's worked. Amen. That's what verse 5 is saying. Hey, women, uh, young ladies, if you want to know, some, if you want some good counsel, go talk to people that have been married for 50 plus years. And, and I promise you this, you'll see most of these principles in action. Even if they're not Christian, even if they're not saved, that you will see these principles in action in a working, functioning marriage that lasts long, long periods of time. Amen. Second part I want to point out, verse 6. And I guess you could say this is a role, but really I, I, think, I just want this to be an encouragement. And I'll say this. This can be an encouragement for the men and women. How's that? Women, I'll get on the men a little bit here. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Verse number 6 there, Peter uses an example. Sarah. Sarah and Abraham. And his point here is that she not only obeyed her husband, was in subjection to him, but she called him Lord. Now, ladies, don't. Now you're like, okay, I was with you. I was with you. I was stuck with you. Now you're saying I got to call him Lord. No, no. Miss Holly only calls me Lord at home. I don't make her do that outside. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Here's what, he, here's what I think he's trying to say. She went above and beyond. She, she did more than she, ne she needed to do. A lot of you women are in your marriage and, you're, and, and here's your idea. Here's your thought process. Fine. If I got to listen to him, I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to do the bare minimum of what I have to do. But we know that anything that you'll go above and beyond in helps you, doesn't it? If you go above and beyond in your job place, if you get there early, you work hard, extra hard, you go above and beyond for your boss to do a good job, that helps you excel, doesn't it? If you do that in sports, it helps you excel. If you do it in any aspect of your life, putting forth more energy, going above and beyond your minimum requirements is going to help you. So my encouragement to men and women here, don't just do the bare minimum of your, of your obligation as a husband or wife. Go above and beyond. It helps. It's going to help you out. I'll, I'll use a man example so I don't offend any women here. It, used to drive, it still drives me nuts. Uh, I, I have a lot of friends that weren't married, that got married either in college or after college that I see now. 
And if you saw them before marriage, they're like, you know, five foot 11, 160 pounds. You see them after marriage and they're like five foot 11, 220. They got this big gut and everything looks like it's tight. I'm like, dude, what happened? Oh, the marriage life, man. She cooks real good. She takes good care of me. And here's why it bothers me. Why, why, will, why would a man work so hard to be in shape and look good for a prospective wife? Then once he gains said wife, decide, now I can just... Because she's stuck with me anyway. Amen. Man, I'm talking to you here. I'm, again, ladies, I'm not talking to you, ladies. I, I don't want y'all to ever... I'm not talking about weight or looks at all the ladies. That scenario, I am bright enough and wise enough to stay away from at this age. But men, I'm not ashamed to say, if, if you tried real hard before you were married, you keep trying for her now. Amen. That's right. Why, why is it okay? All the things you hid and all the things you tried to be, be uh, handsome and, and da dapper, I'll use dapper, and, and then as soon as you get married, you go, well, she's stuck with me anyway. <laughs> why? Don't do that. But women, uh, I will say this. If you'll go the extra mile for your job, if you'll go the extra mile for your children, if you'll go the extra mile for anything else in life, for our church, go the extra mile for your husband. Go above and beyond. It'll, I promise you, it's going to get some good results. It's going to get some good results. By the way, verse 1 does imply that you're... It's really the only verse I think that backs up um, evangelistic living. If you'll live a certain way, God promises to give you results. He said, if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversations of your wives. What he's very clearly saying there is God saying, he's either going to get right or I'm going to get rid of him. Pretty much. Okay. Thank you, ladies, so much for staying involved, staying paying attention. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm so glad that you didn't throw tomatoes or something at me. Now is the chance, ladies, to keep listening, though, because now is your chance to say amen, right? Because I'm going to get on the guys. Now, some of you are already looking at this and going, hang on. How come the ladies get six verses and the guys get one? Six verses for the women and the dudes get one? Well, if you're married, if you've ever tried to communicate with a man, you know why. God's a whole lot smarter than we are. He said, I created women and I know they can keep it. I can throw a lot of information at them and they'll grasp it all. Men, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to enunciate because I know you're a little bit slower. That's why it's one verse, ladies. I didn't write it. I'm just letting you know God knows us men better than you do, maybe. Or if you're married, you're probably like, yeah, no. Yeah, one verse is probably too much if we're being honest at this point. Okay, so let's get to the men. I know I'm running out of time. I got to hurry, but here we go. First thing said to the husband, your first role is to dwell with them, your wife, according to knowledge. According to knowledge. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> Let me simplify it for you there, dummy. Uh, it means you don't just live with her. Because as soon as you hear dwell, you're like, well, pastor, I mean, I go home to her every night. Obviously, I dwell with her. No, that's why he said, uh, dwell with her according to knowledge. Meaning this, I, I wrote it down, I want it to be clear. It means live with her in a way that she enjoys based on your knowledge of her. I'm going to say that again. Live with her in a way that she enjoys based on your knowledge of her. Men, every man in, the, man in this room probably is the same way. I like when my wife is around, but I don't want to have to communicate at all. I like when she's there, but I don't want to talk. I, I just, I want you there. But don't interrupt the football game. Don't interrupt the basketball game. Don't interrupt what I'm thinking or doing. Just be here. And to men, that is dwelling. Newsflash, men. That's not what women count as dwelling. You watching TV on the couch in the same room with her is not, in her mind, spending quality time together. It may be to you, but it's not to her. That's why I said, in knowledge. In knowledge, meaning what she, what you've learned she likes to do. And here's the tip. The tip. She likes your time, quality time. Amen. If you're married, what your wife needs, if you're thinking about getting married, be ready because what your future wife will need, men, is your time. That's it. That's mainly, well, what are we supposed to do? I don't know. You learn your own wife. I'm still trying to figure mine out. <laughs> She's changed six times since we started dating. <laughs> But I do know this about my wife. She's asking me for a swing outside because while we watch it, when it gets nice outside, she wants to sit outside on a swing and watch our kids play. I know that my wife likes stupid Christmas Hallmark movies that all have the exact same plot. I know that. Yeah. Every one of them. But guess what? I've seen quite a few. Why? Because I'm dwelling with her according to knowledge. I don't know what your wife likes to do. I don't know. 
That's your job to figure out. You're the one that's supposed to get some knowledge on her. Whatever it is, if your wife likes the outdoors or she likes to travel or she likes to have quiet dinners where you have long conversations, if she likes to take walks, whatever it is, it's your job to figure it out, men, and then do it. Dwell with her according to knowledge. Ladies, amen. Amen. Okay, I was trying to help you. That's fine. Okay. Number two, men. Or actually, number two is according to knowledge. Number one's dwell with her. Number two is according to knowledge. So spend time with her. Spend time with her doing the things she wants to do. Kind of clear. Make that simple for you. Number three. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, already women go, oh, weaker vessel. Well, pastor, I, women aren't weaker. I, I know this girl at the gym that she could kick your butt. And I bet she's single. <laughs> that didn't go over so well. But I was serious. <laughs> All right, this is what weaker means. Weaker does not mean less valuable. In fact, weaker usually implies more valuable. You know what? Silk costs a whole lot more than denim. Here's another example. If you have a fine china bowl that's got the gold rim and stuff, that is much weaker than a plastic bowl from Walmart for 50 cents. Guess which one if you drop is going to break? Guess which one also holds a whole lot more value? Mm -hmm. That's the wife. Mm -hmm. Well, my wife isn't the kind of woman that you respect. Then why did you marry her? <laughs> Honor your wife. Make sure everyone knows that she's the most important person in the world to you. Well, she isn't. Then make her that because that's you. if you married her, she's supposed to be. Treat her like a lady, the same as you would treat a fine china plate. You know, if we had a fine, we don't, because we, we have kids, so we're smart enough not to. If we had fine china plate, guess what? It's not going in the dishwasher. The children aren't going to be allowed to touch it and mess with it. And, and some of you are treating your wife like she's nothing special. No, she, is, she should be the most special person in the world to you, even if you have kids. Because guess what? Your kids grow up and get married and go off and have their own lives and start making something even more precious than them, grandkids. But your wife, as long as you're both living, is going to be with you forever. The way you act around her and the way you treat her should communicate to all. She is the most special person in the room to you. Honor her. Honor. Treat her good. Treat her like a lady. By the way, this can go back to some of that go the extra mile for her. If you did it before you got married, men... Keep opening the door. Now, I don't open the door very much for my wife anymore, mainly because we've got to get like four kids, three kids, a car seat and an oxygen tank and all that into a car. So it's easier for her to just get in and I'll just, I'll load up the 50 kids. And, uh, but when we're alone, I always open the door for her. You say, well, I don't really like, I mean, it just takes that much longer. I know, but isn't she worth it? Amen. That's right. uh, Amen. Even if you have a joint checking account, pick up the tab. I, I know it's, it's, it, it kind of cracks me up in marriages, you know, like, are you paying or am I paying? Like, my parents will say that kind of stuff because it's, you know, it's all the same, but it's just like, who's going to actually go pay the bill? Man, get up and go pay the bill. Why? Because you're showing her honor. Treat her with great respect and dignity because she is fine china and you're just a plastic bowl. Be glad you got her anyway. Okay. Glad you ladies are having fun. <laughs> And as being heirs together of the grace of life. Number four, you are in this together, act like it. That's what he says. And being heirs together of the grace of life. You're in it together. Now, men, I know. If you're the leader of your home, the final decision falls on you. I understand in my home, the final decision on everything. Purchases, uh, moves, activity, whatever. It falls on me. But guess what? There's not a single decision I ever make, especially the big ones, that I don't sit and talk at length with my wife, wife about. Until usually we both have peace about it. Why? Because we're in this together. Even if it's my decision, she's got to live with it. So men, include your wife in everything. Don't keep things from her. You act like you're in this together. Until one of you dies, you're supposed to be in it together. So just be open about everything. Remember, it's a together agreement. Okay. Next one. I got to hurry. It's kind of a strange statement. He says, 
that your prayers be not hindered. That your prayers be not hindered. Now, I've come up with two things that this could mean. And, and I've, I agree with different commentators on which one I say. So I'm just going to go with both. I think they both apply. I don't think either one of them is a mistreatment of the text. He says, that your prayers be not hindered. First, men, if you mistreat your wife. By the way, I hate this statement. Well, I don't hit her. I don't cuss at her. I don't yell at her. So I'm good to her. No, just because you don't do those things doesn't make you a good husband. Now, if you are doing those things, it does make you a bad husband. But just because you don't do those things doesn't make you a good husband. You could be no better to her than the dog, honestly. Uh, but man, if you mistreat your wife, why would you think God is interested in helping you? No, no. Listen to the statement. God, I want your help with this, even though I'm mistreating the greatest help you will ever give me. Right? What is a wife called? A help meet. She's brought alongside to help you. And if you mistreat your greatest help on this planet, why do you expect God that is going to expect to help you when you need it? Treat her right, and then your prayers will be answered. But I also think it could have this, in the context, you could say this. Uh, prayer in verse 7 is referred to praying for her. You have a duty to pray for your wife, man, by the way. You do have that duty. You need to pray for her every day. She needs a lot of prayer, mainly because she's either dealing with your kids, dealing with your problems, dealing with your mess, dealing with you. She needs your prayer. <laughs> you have a duty to pray for your wife. And if you aren't dwelling with her according to knowledge and honoring her and her and approaching life together, you aren't going to pray for her like you should. Does that make sense? Your prayers will be hindered if you're not loving on her and honoring her and spending time with her and knowledge like you should be. Your prayer for her is going to be hindered because you don't care about her as much because you're not. Listen, I can pray for things I know and care about a whole lot better than I can pray for things that are obstruction or abstract to me. That was the word I was going for. Uh, we have a lot of names on our prayer list. Some of those names, all I know them from is from a prayer list. So when I pray for those, I can mean it with all sincerity, but all it is is a name on a piece of paper. And then I can pray for somebody like Autumn or Miss Diane or my own wife or my own kids in a whole different way because to me, I know them. They're important to me. Does that make sense? So if, you're, if she's not important to you, your prayer for her will not be the same. Okay, let's wrap this up. Our society needs godly families. Church needs godly families. Our country needs godly families. But godly families don't start with children. Families start with I do. A man and a woman agreeing to spend the rest of their lives together. If you do not fulfill your role as a husband or a wife, there's no hope of your family running correctly. Just how if car parts of the, parts of the car don't fulfill their roles, they're designed for, the car won't run properly. Mom and dad, those kids need you to fulfill your roles as a husband and a wife. Your wife, husbands need you to fill the role of a God-given husband. Wife, your husband needs you to fulfill the God-given role of a wife. Grandparents, by the way, don't think you're out of this. You're married, but also you got grandkids that you could be influencing too. Maybe great. I don't know. There's one thing that makes fulfilling these roles easier though. One thing that, that really helps you out. This is what it is. If Jesus is helping you. Well, I say all that to say this. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior today, and you say, man, I struggle to love my husband. I struggle to respect him. I struggle to be in subjection to him. Well, um, you need to get saved for you. But if you are saved, it's going to help you love him better because you're going to have experienced the love of God that passeth all understanding. The God that loved you first. Husbands, uh, you say, well, I just, I, I, I don't treat my wife as I should. I don't love her how I should. I don't, I'm not as good to her as I should be. If you're not saved, uh, now's a good time to kind of start over. You get saved, you, you accept Jesus Christ's great love for you, you accept the gift that he gave you by dying on the cross for your sins, and then he will help you love her better. You'll have a better understanding of it, knowing him as your personal savior. And what is great is even if you haven't fulfilled your roles up to this point, you can get saved, God will forgive you, and you can go forward a new creature. It'll be like, you'll be, wife, a spouse, if your husband gets married, it'll be like married and you, you were married to a brand new man. Should be. Women, if you get married, your husband will be like he's marrying a brand new man. And God can do something miraculously with that. I say all that to say, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior.